Let's be Jordan. quiet, everybody. Uh, yeah, you say it. <laughs> okay, oh, go ahead. Keep all right. So thank you all for coming. I'll try to, try to keep this kind of interesting. Um, at the same time, we're going to have a lot of assembly in here. So if you want to go to sleep, that's cool. But um, we're going to get kind of interesting, I think, anyway. Um, had some criticisms in the last couple of years about uh, conference talks not being technical enough. And then I realized I wasn't doing technical enough talks anymore either. So um, I'm tired of all the kind of meta crap. Let's get in the nitty gritty, like sort of what our either hobby or professions are based on. So um, let's, let's have a little fun and talk about some, some not too deep stuff, but relatively deep. So by day, I'm a researcher at Barracuda Labs, um, focusing mostly on studying malicious messaging in general, whether it comes on social networking, email, IM, whatever, just how the stuff gets to people. And whether it's spam, whether it's selling you know, Viagra, whether it's your typical kind of drive-by download browser exploit, regardless of how it, what it does, it's more how it gets there we're looking into. Um, do a lot of data and trend analysis in the bigger field of security, blah, blah, blah. But I, I do a lot of Ruby hacking. I love Ruby. For some reason, it, it works really well with how my brain works, so I don't have to think a lot about it. Um, past lives, I did control system stuff, wrote more snort rules than any man ever should, done a lot of reversing, and of course, asse assessment work. But none of that's really interesting. What is interesting is our session roadmap. And we're going to do this in kind of a war story format. This is what I did um, while a lot of you were at Black Hat and DEF CON this year because I had a new baby arrived, so couldn't leave the house. But instead, I decided to hack on APKs and uh, JRuby a little bit. So over the course of, I don't know, 8 to 12 hours or so, so really simple stuff. I'm not that smart. Uh, learned how to reverse the bytecode and then script it a little bit. So I'm just going to walk you through that process. Um, the kind of things that I found made it simpler, and we'll have some good code examples throughout. And I've got links to all the other tools that we do. Um, we're going to talk about Android slash Dalvik VM a little bit. Um, you'll see a couple graphics that you've probably seen in every Android talk ever given. Um, I'm going to talk about reversing the APKs, the disassembly static analysis, and a little bit of dynamic analysis, and then the fun part of control and scripting it for our own purposes. And the goal in everything I do, I, I had an uh, AI professor in college, and I ended up dropping the class because AI is incredibly boring. Um, but he, he said always do the dumb thing first, and that's kind of stuck with me. So I try to apply that to any project I work on. Do the stupid thing first, and if it works, you're done. So we're going to build on a lot of work that other smart people have done. So our problem that we're approaching is there's this hot new social startup that we want to be a part of. Uh, it's called Twacebook. And of course, this isn't a real thing. It's um, the general social network. You know, A lot of you probably work for some similar companies of just get a lot of users and we'll figure out money later kind of business model. Um, so we're going to look at that. Because of course, spam and, and malware distribution is very effective on here because you get a lot of eyeballs. So it's got a great web interface. And that's cool because it gets a lot of users looking at it. It's got a great API. but. The web interface to, to create users, it's hard to script because it has this uh, crap here at the bottom. And that's really hard for a computer to read. That's basically the whole reason they exist. So we want to get around that. Um, thankfully, people are really worried about friction these days. You don't want to keep the user from using your app at all. So things like mobile, things like tablet apps, you don't put much protection in place for creating new users or, or all kinds of activity because you want it to be as frictionless as possible. And that's good for us. So what I thought about, and, and this was all trying to figure out how spammers do it because uh, there's clearly a lot of different ways that they do it. And I wanted to kind of prove a concept and to see if this could work. So this is the approach that I took. So I'm guessing that the mobile app, we can probably at least get the keys out of to do a lot of our own things. And we can look at the APIs that it's calling, because it's, they're probably looking at a lot of the same web APIs. And these pro people probably eat their same dog food inside as they do for outside developers. We're going to target Android here, because Android is honestly just easier. I had a, a minuscule bit of experience with, with JVM stuff looking at it. And I had absolutely none on the iOS side, so I, I picked the Android app to go from. So that's kind of our starting point, where I, where I started looking at it. 
Um, some of the more assumptions and hopes that we're going to work from and, and hope for things to work. Uh, they've got a really well documented API. Tracebook is awesome about this because they want third party developers to use their tools. Um, and it's protected by OAuth. Everybody, is anyone familiar with OAuth? Show of hands, a couple. All right, OAuth. We're going to talk about that in a second. But um, so OAuth, we're probably going to need to extract some keys. That's, that's kind of our job one with looking at this APK we're going to look at. And again, we're, we're going to assume they use their own API. So we're going to go digging through the APK, and we're going to step through kind of getting to the basics of that. It's going to be a lot of command line here for a little bit and a lot of uh, assembly later. So we're in for fun. First step is inter intercepting app communications. And thankfully, again, a lot of people have written a lot of really good tools that we can build on to do all this. This one gives us a great start. So a proxy droid. It just does full transparent proxying of everything coming out of your Android device to wherever you want it to. So you just set up your man in the middle proxy, whatever um, you want it to be. In this case, I ended up using Burp, which we'll talk about a little bit, because it's really good for HTTP proxying, and that's what I'm assuming the API is. Um, so proxy droid, very simple setup. We won't go into the details there. Uh, we're also going to need to intercept SSL because the developers of Twacebook aren't idiots. So with any sort of app that you're reverse engineering, we're going to assume that it's probably SSL. That might be a bad assumption sometimes, but if it's already that broken to start off with, you probably don't need to go to the trouble of reverse engineering the app. So intercepting app communications, this is something else that's wide, widely talked about, and you can find articles about how to put your own SSL uh, CA, certificate authority on the Android device. So we won't get into the full details. But a couple of quick gotchas to mention. Uh, 4.0 devices, if you can work on that, are much, much easier for doing SSL stuff because you can just throw the cert in a directory and you're good. Um, 2.0 kind of sucks a lot. You got to deal with key store and doing it right. And make sure that you have the right bouncy castle version. Otherwise, everything breaks and you need to uh, completely reflash your device or restore from some kind of backup. So the proxy that we're going to use to to um, intercept things is Burp. Everybody loves Burp. Has anybody not tried Burp? You should do it. They have a free version. It's great. It's very scriptable with Java. It's an incredible program. Um, when, I, when I originally did this during Black Hat and DEF CON, it was a little tougher because since uh, Proxy Droid is doing completely transparent proxying, Burp doesn't know what SSL certificate to give to the app. You have to tell it what host name is associated with that cert. Uh, so you have to go through the TCP dump and figure out what DNS requests are coming before the request you're trying to look at, and then give a good guess at what host name is going to be in that SSL cert. So that was kind of a pain. Not a big deal, but you got to dig through packets. Um, thankfully, right after I did this, and this would have saved me about two hours, um, but the 1.4.12 burp release will automatically do that for you. It will monitor the DNS traffic going across and then create certs based on that traffic to present to it. So as long as you've got that root cert on the Android device, it will impersonate with pretty good accuracy um, anything pushed down to it. Again, use Burp. Great people. Buy it. They're good. Uh, so the intercepted traffic. This is what we're looking at. This is what we found to start off with. Uh, so the intercepted traffic, it's pretty much what we're, our assumptions were going to be. Looks like it's very similar to what you're seeing with the, um, the documented APIs. So you see a, a simple HTTP dump here. You got a post, you're creating an account. And we see here at the bottom, we are using OAuth. If you're not familiar with OAuth, we're going to dig a little bit deeper into that. But you see a consumer key that's associated with it. You got a nonce. Uh, the signature method is uh, HMAC SHA, blah, blah. But you see the real, um, real meat of it here at the bottom. It's weird having that screen there and this screen here. I want to point, but anyway. Um, so we got a password, an auth username that we're creating. So this is awesome. We're, we've got this far along. So we're going to need to get these secret keys, though. We see what the public key is that it's passing over, the consumer key. But we need the secret key. A um, little sidebar here on OAuth. So what happens is it's, it's basically... Uh, you, cr you create a, a secret key and a public key. And the public key is largely just an identifier to look up the secret key with, uh, is how it works in practice. 
uh, you've got consumer and then you've got um, tokens. Consumers are like what the app has for their secret key. And tokens are more what the user who's using the app gives to that app. It's a little convoluted and there's quite a dance going on. Uh, 1.0 is, is fairly easy to understand. 2.0 is a, a, a mess and then some, and some of the original founders of OAuth have backed away from the 2.0 series and it's kind of convoluted, but it's very popular with web APIs these days. So if you don't already know OAuth, you, you probably should look at it and get a good understanding of it. Um, but it basically allows you to use the app without giving them your password. Uh, you authenticate with Tracebook and then they give the app a new secret key to use on your behalf. Um, it's usually done with signing requests with uh, HMAC SHA-1. Uh, continuing this sidebar, uh, basically users don't have to get their password and that's really good. Uh, providers get to restrict apps, app, app access that they want. It's, it's essentially DRM for apps and we're not really seeing it framed in that kind of context and, and it has some reasons for it and there, some are very valid. But I don't get to choose the app that I want to access your API. You get to choose the apps that you allow to access your API. So I, th I think that's somewhat limiting and we'll see some problems with that later on as services get tighter and tighter about what they're allowing. I think we're already seeing that some in the whole social world of some of these companies kind of restricting down on the third party apps that they're allowing use from. Uh, some for very good reasons, some for not so good reasons. Um, but also these, these OAuth keys are designed to be server to server. They really weren't designed to push down to the client. But everyone is pushing them down to the client. And what do we know about keys that go down to the client? Everyone say it with me, they get compromised. Because if I have physical access to the device, it's just a matter of how badly I want to find these keys. So if your signing keys are down on the app, well, we know what we're looking for now. Um, it's not as harsh as I'm, I'm being with this slide because, of course, DRM has some value. And if it restricts 99% of the users from doing something negative, it's probably doing what they want it to do. Um, but it, it's a lot like the, the fancy, like, torque screws. And then everybody got torque screwdrivers. So then they got those crappy Y ones that everybody hates and got to buy the special screwdriver for, like, 20 bucks on Amazon to be able to take apart your Mac. Very similar kind of process. So anyway. We'll, we'll end that digression, and we're back to the binary. Because we've thought about OAuth a little bit, realized it angers us up, and we want to get these keys out. Because then we're going to use the keys to create all these um, wonderful aggregation users that we're going to use to interact with this network. So again, doing the dumb thing first. APKs are glorified zip files. That's the way that Java programs are packaged, and APKs are a, a subset of Java that we're going to talk about a little bit with Davik. So dumb thing first, we pass strings and look at it. And of course, you get a whole lot of other junk. You're not just getting this out of strings. And if you are, somebody's playing a cruel joke on you. Um, but we see that our assumptions are right when we do this. We, we looked at the strings. We're seeing some OAuth things. We're good. We, we know we're, we're in the right area. The way that Android apps work is they run on this uh, Dalvik virtual machine. And if you're familiar with Java at all, you know that there's Java and then there's the Java virtual machine. There's Java bytecode that the Java virtual machine translate into the native bytecode that then runs on the system. Uh, like I said, we're going to get a little nitty gritty soon. The real difference between a jar file and a uh, and an APK is the size is reduced and it runs on a little bit of a subset of the JVM, which Dalvik is. It does, it's not a full implementation. I'm not even sure if it's a proper subset, but it, it works most of the time. Um, when you're trying to, you know, but it's, it's deduped, it's compressed, it's basically made for low memory applications and made specifically for working um, on mobile devices. It's a register based machine, uh, runs the DEX files, like I said, and the bytecode we're going to be looking at, it's, it tends to be called Smalley with people who are reversing it. Um, there's probably a better name for it, but Smalley and Back Smalley are one of the tools that you use for disassembly and reassembly, so it's just kind of called Smalley the human readable bytecode that we're going to look into. Uh, APK tool is a nice wrapper for things. Again, very smart people who wrote this that we can use. In theory, this allows for some nice debugging, but it really doesn't because the project's kind of been abandoned and kind of kept up with, with a few other people. So debugging is something like NetBeans or Eclipse doesn't really work as well as you thought. Initially, when I'm going down this path, 
I, uh, I picked up NetBeans and read a lot of documentation about being able to just set a breakpoint in the Smalley and being able to analyze the registers there. That would have been awesome. However, it doesn't work without a whole lot of finagling around. So we didn't worry about that. Let's, let's keep going deeper and see what we can find. So we run APK tool, disassemble it. So we've got our, uh, our full manifest here. And you see uh, the listing here, you got assets, res, and underneath the Smalley directory, this is basically all the Java class files. Your aa.smalley, your av.smalley. And of course, these are reduced down um, to single, single letter and then built up kind of names, uh, both for saving size and for a little bit of obfuscation. Clearly, it doesn't buy you a lot, and there's some other tools that give you a lot more obfuscation, but it, it does a basic level. Thankfully, we didn't see a whole lot of obfuscation here with uh, Twacebook as we'll go through it. But these Smalley files are really what we're going to look at because that's, that's the meat. That's the code of the application that we need to look at and extract these keys from and understand what's going on. Who's done any sort of disassembly in their life? Show hands. Awesome. Uh, I love disassembling stuff. So the rest of you, this probably looks like nothing at all and a little bit insane. But it's really pretty simple when you get down to it. And, and uh, the Smalley bytecode is actually kind of a pleasure to uh, reverse engineer compared to some of the other architectures you'll look at. So if you want to get started reverse engineering, it might be a nice place to kind of get a, a reasonable thing going from. We'll get back to that page and, and show. But first things we're going to look at. It's a register-based machine. These are stored in P0. The parameters passed into a function are stored in registers at P0 through however many parameters are passed in. So if you have two parameters, you're going to have P0 and P1. Have three, you're going to have P0, P1, P2. Very simple. And then local registers that you're going to use for everything else during the function. Uh, basically storage things. Um, you probably won't see it, but if you do, um, where it does some weird code things, it, optimization, the last uh, number of parameter registers are also mirrored in the local registers. So V like 8 will also be equal to P3. They're identical to each other. Um, also, some, there are 32-bit values. Some are stored across two registers. The long and the double primitives are stored two registers. Uh, here's some more of the primitives that you'll see that you're going to be working from when you're disassembling Smalley. Uh, it can be a void type, Boolean type, um, and so forth. This is how it's going to read in the human, human um, readable bytecode. So we look at this with that bit of knowledge, and it gets a little bit, little bit uh, easier to read. So we see that first line. If you've done any Java, the first line looks very similar to anything else you're going to see. So it's declaring a method, it's a private method, it's a static method, and it's named A. And this method takes in uh, one, two, three, four, five uh, parameters. P0 is that first one. It takes in a HTTP base class. So it tells you exactly what it's taking in. Very easy to understand what these functions are getting called with. Uh, the J, like I said, is a, um, is a long, so it takes in a long as well, and then a couple of strings, and uh, the return type is given a string. Very simple. If you looked at any code, this will, you know, after you, after you look at it and get an understanding, it, it's just like any other code. Deciphering opcodes, of course, every machine language has opcodes. We're not going to get too terribly deep into this because we could spend forever uh, looking at these, but, but they're very simple. These are very atomic, very low level functions. Move result moves the result of the last function into whatever register is, in there, is passed into it with VX. Uh, return objects re puts the return object there. Uh, invoke direct, pass in the parameters, it tells you what method to call. Very similar. You can read all about it. That link. Back to the bytecode. So we're digging through and we're, we're figuring out this is the location in the code. Of course, we're skipping through the steps of figuring out the location, but it's largely string searching and, and figuring out what's set where. Um, you see this format string here that was in our H HTTP request that we intercepted. So we got the OAuth realm, OAuth version, the consumer key, and so forth. So that's, that's that. And we see they create, uh, create array of objects and fill the array. So we know around here is where the action is happening. This is where this request is being built. So moving further than that, we're getting warmer. We know that this is the general area. So we find this function is what leads to that signature being created. So whatever's passed into this function 
probably is the keys, because the keys are what creates the signature. So it's probably just thinking off the top of our heads from where we're reversing, it's going to be probably a key, maybe another key, and whatever the parameters that we're signing are. This leads us into this, and I just lost a lot of people. Uh, so this, this is where the crypto happens. You see the functions being called. It gets the bytes from a string. It gets a crypto secret key spec. You see it's calling the HMAC SHA-1. This is building it up, but this is still kind of tough to understand. So if you've never done it before, you don't really know how to do crypto in Java, you're not a Java guy. I'm not a Java guy. I'm not an enterprise guy at all. Um, so I did a search to figure out how people are doing this in Java. <laughs> and thankfully, the person who wrote the Twacebook API did the same search. Because if you look at this and see how they match up, you get an instance, you got a secret key spec. Um, huh, you're seeing a lot of commonality there. So that allows us to do a little off to the side prototyping and figure out exactly what's happening with our app, how it's signing things. So we know the second parameter passed in is going to be the key. Again, doing the dumb thing first. We turn to the favorite tool of any freshman year computer science major, the printf debugging. Everybody know what printf debugging is? It's when you don't actually use a real debugger, you just print out the value that you got. And it's a terrible hackish way to really debug, but it gets you there fast. So thanks to the way that APKs are designed um, and Smalley, we can insert our own code into the Smalley and then rebuild it and run it on our device. So here we just have a constant string that we have a secret key, v0, and then we're invi invoking this nice little static call that's built into Android uh, APK that's logging out our key value. So it shows up nicely in our console when we connect to our Android device. Rebuild it and run it uh, with those simple commands. Examine the logs and boom, we're there. So we got secret keys, so that's cool. We're, we're getting there, we're getting most of the way there. Uh, we just have to duplicate the functionality to call these same APIs, which shouldn't be that big of a deal. Um, and then we can create all these fun users to interact on this social network and really become part of their community. Um, but then sadness occurs and a lot of confusion. Because these keys, they aren't creating the same uh, signatures. And it took me quite a while to figure out why. It was really confusing because I had the secret key there. I had it. I knew I was right. Um, the problem is these, these devs were extra sneaky. And they passed their, um, their signature into another method that hashes it itself. So they're not really using OAuth anymore. They're doing a little custom sneaky stuff off to the side because they didn't want other people just stealing the keys and doing the dumb thing first, which is cool. I commend them for that. They did well. Um, but at the same time, it's just another layer to pull back before we get to the center of that onion, that sweet, sweet onion. Uh, so custom hash, custom hoding, coding, whatever. We, we eventually get to the function that does this, custom hashing. And this is a mess. Like, it's nasty. You can see just looking at this, it gets an output stream. It's adding integers. It's a mess of, like, go-tos and spaghetti code. It's just ugly. So, so we're pretty dejected at this point because I don't want to re-implement that code. At best, it's going to take a long time. It's going to be very error-prone. Uh, especially doing it like Ruby that I want to do it in because I like hacking on Ruby. And it's just not really designed for that kind of nastiness. Um, nothing's really designed for that kind of nastiness. But then we have a thought. See, one of the best implementations of JRuby, of Ruby, that you should be using if you're doing anything real with Ruby is JRuby, which is Ruby implementation created in Java and it runs on the JVM. It gives you a lot of really great things from a sidebar programmer point of view. It gives you nice threading. It gives you uh, really good memory management. You lose some of the gems that have uh, custom C extensions, but you gain about a million Maven packages that Java devs have written. And let's face it, Java devs are probably a lot more disciplined than Ruby devs um, for the most part because they're largely focused on a more enterprise kind of world. So you give some, but you get a lot more. 
Uh, you also get great debugging tools and a lot of happiness. Uh, so we're thinking, um, one of the things that JRuby allows us to do is just call methods in jar files, just like the Ruby methods. And that's cool. Wonder if we can do the same with our APK. Because APKs are basically jar files, right? We learned that earlier where we could just unzip them and they have similar kind of structure. They have DEX files instead of jar files. So there's been a wonderful tool written called DEX to jar. Again, very smart people have been here before us to do relatively similar things. And we can build off of them. So we can pass this, uh, this DEX file that we've got from our Twicebook APK and create a new jar file. So that's awesome. And this is really what we're kind of getting to. Because this gives us all the meat of it. We can script any Android package we want. We just have to look a little bit and figure out what functions we want to call within that Smalley output. And then we can just require this, this jar file, the Twicebook jar in this thing, and we can input, import the class name. In this case, the, the class name was, yes, question? Oh, nope, they're doing something else. Uh, <laughs> So the class name that we found that was doing the encryption is CC. We bring it in, we call it obfuscator. Then we can just call these Java methods. So we don't have to re-implement any of these algorithms. And a nice little fun thing about uh, scripting the APKs in this way is the better that the code is architected and designed, the more loosely coupled it is, the more you're able to just completely script everything and, the, and not have many side effects at all. Uh, here we just have the byte array that we're passing in that we want signed and we get the signature out. And we don't have to do any hard work at all. We don't even have to have the keys stored in our file anymore. They're already stored in the APK. So we're there. That's the dynamic point. This, this generalizes to any sort of APK. There's some differences between the Dalvik and the, um, and the um, regular JVM, but, um, but not a lot. And it works in most cases. It's just a little bit of reverse engineering to get you over the hump, and then it's there. And I had a lot of fun with that, and it worked. And because of that, Happy Panda is very happy. Uh, it, was, it was a fun like little eight hour, 12 hour jaunt down reversing uh, uh, Java stuff. And in the end, we got to script it with Ruby, which is awesome because Ruby lets me develop really fast and probably lets you develop really fast too. I would assume that this thing probably generalizes to uh, Jython and some other ones as well. I haven't looked at that at all, but there's, uh, there's many language implementations built on top of the JVM. Um, more and more we're finding that Java is the least efficient and probably worst way to use the JVM. When you have uh, other awesome languages like Scala and everything else built on top of it that lets you have uh, this really great functionality without uh, paying the price of using Java. Um, so kind of wrapping up and expanding. Uh, this opens up APKs to a lot of code reuse. And this is something we don't really think a lot as, uh, as developers previously. I don't know if Java devs worry about this, that their jars can be reused completely or if that's, uh, or if that's what they rely on obfuscation for. Um, you certainly really don't have to worry about it in the C world or any sort of compiled language for the most part. Um, so this is something to, to think about. If you've got something you really want hidden, you, you probably shouldn't be doing it anyway. Um, you should probably be looking at, um, at protecting the APIs that things are talking to a lot more than protecting any sort of secret or proprietary sauce that's baked into APKs. Um, but code reuse is always great because the best code I use is the code that I didn't write. Because I'm a, I'm a cowboy coder and a hacker, um, like most of you probably are. So um, using like enterprise tested code from uh, good places to do whatever I want makes me pretty happy. Um, this also allows you to do a lot, build testing frameworks like really quickly with the way that you can prototype with Ruby. Uh, you already know what the function parameters are that are being passed into these functions, so you can very quickly um, write these testing frameworks to build those parameters out and pass them into the function, see if anything interesting happens. Um, dynamic analysis, blah, 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 and bypassing anything you don't want to deal with is, is always fun. Uh, again, there's probably some certain inconsistencies there between the Dalvik uh, virtual machine and the standard like Sun or OpenJVK uh, JVM. But uh, regardless, you're, you're probably going to have a lot of fun if you start looking at this. I, I know I did in, in my exploration and wanted to share that with everybody because 
Uh, it's a lot of fun. I don't think I've seen too many other people playing with this. So um, have fun with it. A little bit of audience participation because we got just a couple minutes left. Probably, what, two, three? Something like that on the minutes left. Not getting anything from my handler over there. Uh, thanks to Bay Thread organizers, uh, sure. the devs in, sure. uh, of sure. all the tools that we use, and uh, JRuby and the Smalley uh, rooms on IRC are great to get a handle on this kind of stuff if you want to get into it. Uh, Jesus Freak is one of the Smalley back Smalley devs who helped me a whole lot. So sure. I, sure. I'm pretty sure you're not here, but if you are, thanks a lot. I'll buy you a beer later. Uh, and the Barracuda Labs team that, let, that went to Black Hat and DEF CON without me and let me play. Any questions? There's all my stuff. Questions? Anybody? Got one. Uh, so if you wanted to, to reverse a bunch of these apps at once, say in bulk, to try to extract um, authentication keys, could you just go out and connect to the Google Play Store and just download everything that's free and then search through that for keys? Yeah, so the question that wasn't mic'd up too high was, can you just download all the APKs from the Google Store and just run it through like an automated system? Probably. I honestly don't know about downloading from the Google Play Store without using an Android app, because I was just doing one-offs with the, uh, the handful of apps that I went through to prove a concept this. I, I assume you can, but honestly don't know. And anybody know if you can just download APKs straight from the web, or if you have to you know, forge some user agents or or whatever else, anybody know? Answer is it's a pain in the ass. So maybe just do it through your Android device and pull the APKs off of that. It's easily done in uh, just a couple of ADB commands. Got a question over there if you want to run. Microphone coming. <laughs> We've had some success uh, intercepting APK files off the firewall. We basically put a proxy on the firewall and grab APK files off our, our user base. I, I'm not sure. I'm, you block APKs at the firewall? We grab APK files as our users are Oh, and then, OK. Yeah, that'd be a good way to do that is, is just look for the, uh, the header signature on the APKs and grab them off the firewall and then pass it through your testing frameworks to see what you're getting. That, that would be a good way to do it. Because um, they're, they're a pretty easy format to figure out on the wire. All right, anybody else? Thank you all very much. I appreciate it a lot.